Help is here. So have you ever planned something and it didn't go the way you expected? It seems like uh, life is all about plans that we make and it doesn't go the way we hope or anticipate or expect things to happen. I mean, how many of us had made plans during the spring or the summer and our plans had to change? I mean, for, for my family and I, uh, baseball is a big thing, and we had to skip it, and now we're back into it, so I'm okay with that a little bit. But even more than that, my, my family had planned a vacation this summer. Uh, we had planned to go to Washington, D.C. Both of my boys, they, they love history. And so we were looking forward to be able to go to D.C. with them and just be able to see all the different things and, and learn and to grow together as a family and encourage and challenge each other. But with everything that happened, we had to change plans. I mean, none of us... I think back in the beginning of the year was planning for a worldwide pandemic. I mean, nobody had that on their radar where they said, you know what, I'm hoping we have a pandemic that happens this year. If it happens, it'd be great. I mean, nobody plans for that. And so all of us have had to make changes to our plans. We've had to shift. And what we've been discovering week after week as we walk through the book of Acts is we see a church that had to shift. We see people that had to constantly shift. They had to change what they had planned to do and began to do something else, much like you and I. I mean, we've been walking through day by day, hoping and anticipating, thinking that we have everything figured out and what's next. But then plans change and we have to shift. And so when we began this, we saw that Jesus, if you go back to the Gospels, Jesus dies on the cross, and the disciples are perplexed and confused and heartbroken because everything that they were leading up to was changing. And then we find them in the beginning of Acts where they're with Jesus this one last moment after he rose from the grave before he was to ascend to heaven. And then they watch all that transpire, and then they go and they sit amongst themselves just simply waiting. All right, what's next? What, what are we going to do next? What does tomorrow look like? What does next week look like? What's next month going to hold for us or even next year? And then we see the Holy Spirit come upon them as they sit there and as they wait. And then they begin to move. And as they began to move, we see Peter going out preaching an amazing sermon where thousands of people respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus came to bring hope, that Jesus came to bring life. And so they began to go. And they experienced some of the most amazing things. But even as they had planned, no matter how much they had planned, no matter how much they prepared, even no matter how much they knew that it was going to happen, persecution began to arise. So much so that we see later on in Acts where uh, disciples began to die, friends began to die because of their faith in Jesus. But it didn't stop them. It didn't keep them from moving forward. They didn't see the things that were transpiring. They didn't decide, you know what, enough's enough. This, is, uh, this hostile environment, this isn't what I signed up for. Uh, this isn't what I had prepared or planned for. But yet they continued. And then we see in Acts chapter 9 uh, where Paul, one of these, uh, or Saul at that time, one of these main contributors to persecuting those who followed Jesus, have a life transformation, an encounter that changed everything for him. To where he shifted from persecuting followers of Jesus to actually following Jesus himself. But again, it, it didn't stop there. Because as Paul went... And as Paul went, he began to share the gospel himself. He began to tell others about what Jesus had done for him. Hey, I was on the road. I was traveling to put into prison and to kill people that are followers of Jesus. But I had this encounter with Jesus where he changed everything. He shifted my life from here to there. And I want you to know what he's done for me because I want him to do the same thing for you. And so we see this shift in Saul's life or Paul as we later know him in Acts. And then we see where Saul gets sent out with other disciples, go to other cities to preach the gospel. And he goes, and they see uh, great success. They see people respond. He even goes with a friend Barnabas, and as Barnabas and him go, uh, they're excited about what's happening. They're amazed at what God's doing. 
But then in chapter 15, we see kind of a a disagreement happen between uh, Barnabas and Saul, or now we know him as Paul, where they decide to split ways. Hey, you go that way, I'm going this way. Uh, I think that we have uh, the same thing in mind, even though we're disagreeing about uh, some other things, uh, we still have the same purpose. And so you go where you got to go, and I'm going to go where I got to go. You take your companions, I'm going to take my companions. And that's where we find ourselves in Acts chapter 16. So if you have a Bible or you follow along on the app, I want to encourage you, if you're online, that you would just jump in with me into Acts chapter 16. And we're going to look at five verses this morning, five verses that I think get overlooked a lot. We just kind of read past them so fast because maybe it doesn't make sense. Maybe we don't understand it. Maybe it's just not that significant. But in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 6, and as we go through verse 10, I think we're going to see something pretty amazing where plans changed. It didn't matter how much they prepared. It didn't matter how much they had set in their heart and minds what they were going to do. God had something totally different in mind for Paul. And those that were traveling with him. So in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Messiah, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Again, the reason I say that We skip over this because as we read this, we're like, okay, some guys are going somewhere. And all of a sudden, uh, they were told not to go where they were going, and they're going to go somewhere else. There's this thing about plans. Plans change, but God's purpose remains the same. Think about it for a moment. God here and in this moment, as he spoke to Paul, he said, Paul, look, I know where you're planning on going, but I've got a change of plans, a change of orders for you, and I need you to go somewhere else. I know you had your heart set on returning where you had already been and you wanted to encourage uh, those people that you had already seen and uh, shared your faith with, but I've got something different for you. And so I need you to be aware of that and I need you to go. Again, uh, plans change, but God's purpose for them was to remain the same. It didn't matter that they weren't going back where they had been and that they were going somewhere else. They were still going for the same purpose to share the gospel, to preach the good news. But what's so epic, I think, within these passages is before he even uh, responded to this, we see the Holy Spirit. And you you can't miss this because if you look throughout the entire book of Acts, you see that the Holy Spirit is always showing up and guiding and directing their steps. That they never move on their own, but that they always have God right there directing through the Holy Spirit, guiding them. Guiding them. And, and so often, I think within the American church, when we think of the Holy Spirit, and I've said this before in other sermons, that it's easy for us to begin to understand God is creator, that He created the heavens and the earth and everything that you and I experience, all the good pleasures of life, that He created that. And Jesus, man, He saved me from what I deserve eternity separated from God. I get that. But the Holy Spirit, I can't really wrap my mind around that. What do you you mean by the Holy Spirit? And I hope uh, that you've gone back and you've listened to Pastor Brett's video as he talked about the Holy Spirit. If you haven't, go onto YouTube because he unpacks that a little bit for you. But they move in the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Again, their purpose remained the same. It didn't change. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. His purpose and his plan for you and for me, it's simple. But yet we make it so complicated. We take something that's so easy to be able to tell people, hey, here's who Jesus is and here's what Jesus did for me. And this is how Jesus changed my life. But yet for some reason we want to make it profound or amazing. And it can stand on its own without you and I ever doing anything to prop it up. The gospel that Paul understood his purpose, it didn't matter where he was going. He knew he was going. And the truth be told, you and I are always on the go. I mean, maybe not right now. 
but we live life on the go. That where you go, where I go, that we would simply share the gospel. That we would tell others. So whether I'm going to school or whether I'm hanging out with neighbors in my community or whether I'm going to work or maybe to the grocery store or even uh, to a restaurant or even on vacation, as I go, that I would share the gospel, that I would tell others about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for me. So even though God changed their plans, his purpose for them remained the same. It remains the same. It's it's never going to change. Your purpose, if you're a follower of Jesus, is to proclaim Jesus. It's to worship him with all that you are and to tell others. I mean, it's, it's that simple. And that's what he desires from you and from me. But then it continues on in verse 8. So they passed by Messiah and they went down to Trials. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Come over to Macedonia and help us. I mean, just imagine that for a moment. You're sitting at home. You're planning out your vacation, if you got to take one. But you're planning out what you're going to do, where you're going to go, what it's going to look like. All of a sudden, somebody shows up and says, sorry, scratch that. I I know you've been saving. I know you've been uh, planning, preparing. You've probably, if you're like me, you've probably researched everything that's there, everything that you could possibly do. You've determined, well, I want to do this, or no, I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that this happens. I want to make sure we go here. I want to eat at this restaurant. But then someone shows up. Change of plans. That's not where you're going. And what's uh, uh, amazing about this is it's less about the destination and it's more about the obedience. It's less about the destination of where Paul was going to go. But it was more about his obedience that God, he commanded, he called him to go here instead of there. And he responded that way and said, okay, if that's where you want me to go, I'll go. I'll go. I'll respond out of obedience. I'll trust you that you're planning your purpose. It's bigger than what I could ever plan. It's bigger than whatever I could scheme up or come up with. I'm going to be obedient. But yet we wrestle with obedience because we like to be in control, or at least I do. Obedience is hard simply because we want to be in control. God, I know that you've got plans, but my plans are better. You haven't seen them. I mean, I've spent hours detailing them out. I mean, step by step by step, knowing where I'm going to go and what it's going to look like and who I'm going to encounter. God, if you would just take a moment and sit down and just look at my plan. Paul didn't do that. He just simply responded out of obedience. It wasn't so much about where he was going. He knew that he was going, but he wanted to be obedient to where Jesus wanted him to go. And so he responded out of the obedience. But again, obedience is tough for us. In Proverbs 16, 9, it says, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. It doesn't matter how much we plan. It doesn't matter how much we prepare. Are you allowing God to establish your steps? God, I want to go where you want me to go. I want to do what you want me to do. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter if it's going to play itself out the way that I had hoped or expected. But God, I would simply go because I trust you. I mean, think about that. And maybe obedience isn't a hard thing for you. But I know it is for me and I know it is for my family. I mean, at least for my kids. I mean, when it comes to obeying me, I mean, it's, they have no problem bucking the system. It, I, I know you said that, Dad, but this is better. And that's the exact same thing that we do with God. God, I know that that's your plan, and I I know that you have my good intention in mind, but dude, this plan, it's stellar. I mean, what I got, I I mean, God, you don't want to miss out on this. So what we do, and instead of us joining God and doing what God wants us to do, we ask God to join us. God, I know that you're the creator and you hold the world in your hand, but man, if you could just come with me, if you could just hold my hand and trust me, God, instead of the other way around, 
Jesus, I'm going to hold your hand, and I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to be obedient wherever you want me to go, no matter how difficult it's going to get, because we see that all throughout the book of Acts. It wasn't easy being in the church. I mean, they were in a very hostile environment, but yet out of obedience, they still went, even if it meant that they would lose their life. And it wasn't because they wanted to prove themselves to be right. It wasn't because they wanted people to jump onto the same bandwagon as them. It was simply because they wanted them to know Jesus the same way that they did. That Jesus had changed their life and they wanted them to experience that same life change. So it was because of obedience. But look at what it says in verse 10. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Again, we were created to love Jesus and to tell others about him. The end goal is still the end goal. It, it doesn't change. It, it doesn't change for you and for me as the church. God has a purpose for us, and he wants to use us to be his hands and feet in a world that so desperately needs to know Jesus. A world that desperately needs to know him. And he wants to use you, and he wants to use me. But yet we're crippled by fear instead of driven by faith. The end goal is still the end goal. And I think that when you begin to be understand and, and look at the end goal, what we begin to learn uh, about ourselves, or at least what I've learned about me, is what you are connected to determines how you will respond. What you and I are connected to determines how we respond. And so think about it for a moment. What is, it, what is it that you are most connected to or drawn to or what is it that drives you the most? I've got a rope. Don't worry, I'm going to tie it around my waist. Because when I think about being connected, I think about the things that at least the most common things in our world that we connect to, that drive us, that motivate us, that encourage us, that excite us. And, and some of those things are these things that you see right here uh, behind me. Uh, maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your career that you're so tethered to that no matter how, how, how much you try to get away from it, you're so connected to it. And every decision that you make you use your career as the filter to determine what you do next. Well, this is where I want to go. This is what I want to accomplish. I went to school for this. I've had this dream ever since I was a little boy or a little girl. And I'm so tied to this that no matter how much I, I try to pull away, there's nothing that I can do to disconnect myself because this is it. This is what drives me. Or, or better yet, maybe it's your finances. I've got plans I mean, when I retire, what we're going to be able to do. And so I, I live this life of a person with a closed fist. And I can't experience the blessings of God because I've kept my hands closed to God. Because I've said, God, I know that you tell me in your word that if I want to test you, that the only place that I could test you is in my finances. But I know my finances, God, better than you do. So I'm going to control this, and I'm so connected to this that this determines every decision that I make. No, kids, we can't do that because I'm saving for a new boat. <laughs> I, no, no, I, I know you want to go on vacation this summer, kids, but instead of spending quality time with you, I'd rather get a four-wheeler. And, and maybe it's, it's not your finances. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your family, and family's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that your family's bad, and I'm not saying your career's bad and your finance is bad, but maybe it's your family that drives you, that you're so connected to, that every decision you make is about your family. Well, because, you know, I'm more committed to my kids than I am to Jesus. And so because I'm committed to my kids uh, and, and to their well-being and their future, that every decision I make to help them, I, God, I know you, you say this is what I should do, and this is how I should be as a parent, and this is how I should raise my, my kids, but I, 
Again, I know better. I know what's best for my kids. I mean, my wife and I, we made them. I mean, we should, I see them every day. I, I get them up in the morning. I put them to bed at night. I make their lunch. I send them off to school, or better yet, I send them to the room in my house that I've made as a classroom. I know what's best for my kids and my family. Or, hold on, maybe it's politics. Maybe politics is what drives you. Man, I'm going to do whatever I can to prove them wrong and pull them to my side. Oh, just if you would uh, vote the way that I vote and believe what I believe and allow your politics to derive every decision and conversation that you have, then you would be happy. And man, right now, are we using politics to try to uh, manipulate and and, uh, move people to our side? But maybe it's politics or, hold on, maybe it's relationships. But... That guy or that girl, you don't know them the way that I do. I mean, I just want a relationship so bad. I'll do anything. I'll sacrifice anything. I'll give up anything for that relationship. Even if I know that in the long run, it's going to hurt me. But relationships are are so important to me that every decision I make, it's filtered through my relationships. Or maybe, oh, this is where it hurts me. Maybe it's sports. Man, I was so bummed when baseball didn't start. I'm like, a pandemic, how can it stop baseball? And maybe that's what drives me. Or my decision, you know what? I I can't do this today because I got to watch the game or I got to go to the game. I got to be a part of the game. Because the game is so epic and it's so life-changing that I can't miss one inning of it. What if he throws a no-hitter? I mean, what if he hits the longest home run in history? I mean, this could be a history-breaking game. He, He could do something that's never been done before. I can't miss it. Or, I'm so tied into my kids' sports that every decision I make, no matter how much I try to break this, No, we can't do that because my kid's got a game today. His game's the most important thing to me because I want to encourage and I want to build up my kid. I want to help them be a a strong, vibrant person in society and sports will do that. And, And again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these things are bad and I'm not saying we shouldn't be a part of them. But when they are what drives us and they become our filter for the decisions that we make and even church... Even church becomes the filter because what we end up doing is doing church instead of being the church. And think about it right now, in the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of things not going the way that we anticipated, planned, or expected. Well, what are we going to do? The church can't meet. We we can't gather. How can we be the church if we can't gather? How can we worship Jesus if we can't get together in a building? And Jesus told us the church is in a building, it's the people. And that you and I as the people, if we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus, it's this time, it's right here, right now, that we can go make the greatest impact in the world. Because people around us are hurting. People around us are crying out for help. I've had more phone calls, more emails, more text messages. Life's not going the way that I planned. The church has failed me. Because I put my hope and my trust and my future in a place instead of in a person. What if you and I were so connected and so tied to Jesus that every decision that I make, whether it's politics, family, finances, career, uh, relationships, sports, church, what if Jesus was our filter for all of these? In every decision we made, we went first to him and said, okay, how do I respond to this? How do I respond to this? Because that's exactly what Paul and the others did. The Holy Spirit moved and he spoke and he said, I don't want you to go here. I want you to go there. And out of that, they responded because they were connected to Jesus. 
They were connected. They were so tethered to him that there was nothing that they were going to do that was going to step outside of that because Jesus is in all of this. And he wants to use you and he wants to use me as the church the same way that he used them. And he's asking, I want you to move and I want you to go here. Will you respond? Maybe it's next door to your neighbor. Maybe it's across the street. Maybe it's the colleague at work. Maybe it's the family member that you've been at arm's length because you just, you know, if I talk to them, it's always about something and we always get into an argument. We always, ah, and we leave mad. The Bible tells us that we are to deny ourselves to take up our cross and to follow him. Lay this down. Maybe today for you, Maybe for you, you would see one of these and say, you know what, I'm so connected to that 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 drives every decision that I make. It determines everything that I do. I am so invested in that, Uh, whatever it is. And yeah, I know about Jesus and I know what Jesus has done for me. I know that he died on the cross because he loves me. I know that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And I'll go to Jesus at the most critical moments But all the other times, I know better. I know what he wants. I'm I'm smart. I'm educated. I've studied. I know better than Jesus. I mean, he's got good ideas, good suggestions. But ultimately, I know better. Maybe today that's you. Maybe today for you, you see one of these and you just simply say, God, I got to lay that down to you today i got to give you that. I've, I've been so invested in politics and just arguing with anybody and everybody that I can because I just need them to come to my side. If they would just see it the way that I see it, this whole world would be better. No, it won't. It won't be better. If, man, if my family would just get on the same page, wow, you know how much easier life would be? I mean, if my kids... If they would just do what I want every time I do the dishes. Yes, Dad. Man, my family would be so much better. If my team, if they could just win the World Series, not just get there, but win it, man, life would be so much better. And and again, these aren't bad things. But when these things become more important than Jesus... And we've taken our eyes off of him and we've began to worship other things. So maybe today for you, it starts with knowing that Jesus loves you right where you are. That he loves you right where you are. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, that he loves you. And he's just simply waiting for you to come to him. And so maybe today you want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus. Or, as a follower of Christ, maybe it starts with just simply laying one of these down and saying, God, I give it all to you and I trust you with everything. Will you pray with me?